Welcome back to Horrifying Stories. 50-year-old Cathay Pacific Airways pilot, David Shaw, dived the Bushman's Hole in South Africa, the world's largest freshwater cave, in a record-breaking attempt to recover the body of Dion Dreyer, who went missing in the same cave 10 years earlier. He dived into the dark and still waters on January 8, 2005, a dive that was only expected to last a total of 12 hours. But he was already five hours late. This is his horrifying story. Viewer discretion is advised. It was only three months prior, in October of 2004, since David Shaw first found Dion Dreyer at around 886 feet deep. Divers who dared to go into the depths of Bushman's Hole all knew Dion and his story. Dion Dreyer was of South African descent, coming from the little town of Fariniging, 35 miles south of Johannesburg, South Africa. A thrill seeker since his childhood, Dion already completed 200 dives by the age of 20 and was invited by the South Africa Cave Diving Association to an expedition to the Bushman's Hole. The group planned to descend up to a depth of 492 feet and asked Dion if he could be one of the dive supports. It was Christmas break of 1994 then, so without second thoughts, Dion was all in on the dive. Knowing the dangers of her son's upcoming expedition, his mother Marie Dreyer pleaded with him not to push through with the dive. But Dion was really decided on doing the dive, a decision that tragically ended his life. It was December 17, 1994. The team was just doing a practice dive that day. After reaching their target depth, the team of divers including Dion started with their ascent. Upon reaching 196 feet, diving buddies did their regular exchange of hand signals. Everything looked good as Dion sent his signal to his buddy. However, when they reached 164 feet, a light from below them caught the team's attention. This prompted team leader Dialof Gilliamy to do a quick count off and it was then that they realized one diver was missing. At once, Gilliamy dived down and started chasing for the light. Not long after, he realized the light was just descending too fast that chasing it would be suicide, and so, he stopped. Dion was believed to have suffered a deep water blackout due to excessive carbon dioxide. The dryers were immediately informed of their son's tragic ending. But Dion wasn't the first casualty at the Bushman's Hole. Eben Leiden's life was also cut short in the same cave when he blacked out at 200 feet a year prior. His diving buddy attempted to rescue him as he rushed him to the surface, but Leiden didn't make it. Two weeks after Dion died, his father Theo Dreyer rented a small remotely operated submarine from the De Beers Mining Company. During the search, they found his dive helmet on the cave's floor but sadly, his body had not been located. Knowing their son died doing what he always loved doing, Theo and Marie no longer made further efforts to retrieve their son's body and instead, put out a commemorative plaque on the rock wall above the hole's entrance. When Dave Shaw, an experienced Australian cave diver who had since been based in Hong Kong a few years back, discovered Dion's body, he was in the middle of a record-breaking attempt of diving at depths no diver has ever plunged into, with a closed-circuit rebreather set. Normally, divers do open-circuit diving which involves the use of regulators containing a mixture of gases. With regulators, no gas is ever recycled, all the gas inhaled by the diver is released as the diver exhales it. Closed-circuit diving on the other hand uses rebreathers, wherein some or all of the gas inhaled by the diver is recycled back into the tank. As the diver exhales, the rebreather takes the gas and takes out its carbon dioxide composition, before it recycles the breathing gas for the diver to inhale once again. Only highly skilled and trained divers use closed-circuit diving as it could get very complicated. Rebreathers, however, allow divers to last longer underwater since less gas is consumed. Subsequently, required decompression time also becomes shorter as less gas needs to be released from the body as well. So, with six gas cylinders and the whole rebreather setup strapped around his body, Dave dived deep into the dark waters of Bushman's Hole. 
This sinkhole located in northern Cape province of South Africa is seemingly the size of a swimming pool from the surface but if you go deeper than 150 feet, its narrow walls lead up to a main chamber that was roughly 770 feet by 250 feet in size. Its floor was sloping, the first touchdown being at 863 feet and it goes at a maximum depth of 927 feet. Aside from a record-breaking depth with a rebreather, Dave also wanted to be the first to connect a cave line attached to the shot line from above the surface. So after breezing through his dive to the hole's bottom, he attached a reel to the end of the shot line and started drawing it as he calmly dived deeper following the hole's slope. He looked around the darkest depths as he went along, and when his dive computer displayed a depth of 886 feet, his curious eyes caught a glimpse of an unexpected discovery. His light beamed onto a dead man's body on its back with arms stretched out 50 feet away from him. Turning to his left, he headed towards the body knowing exactly who it was. Dion's tanks and dive harness was still attached to his body, still clothed in his black and tan wetsuit. His head and hands were clearly all bones at this point, 10 years since he was last seen, but strangely, his mask was still firmly around his skull. Wanting to take Dion's body with him, Dave tried to lift it but couldn't. He kneeled down and attempted to lift it a second time but the body didn't budge even the slightest inch. Dion's equipment seemed to have been buried in the mud. Dave struggled to lift it out but immediately realized he was risking his own life at the depth that he was in. He was exerting too much effort and he was already a minute past the limit he set for himself so he tied the other end of the cave line to Dion's tanks and began with his ascent. When he reached the depth of 400 feet, his close friend Don Shirley who had been waiting for him checked his condition. As his condition was deemed good at that point, Dave took out his underwater slate and wrote that he found a body at 886 feet. Amazed, Don shook Dave's hands congratulating him on this unexpected discovery then ascended ahead of Dave. With the depths that Dave was able to reach, he had to stay underwater for another 8 hours and 40 minutes in multiple decompression stops. At that point, Don knew Dave would definitely come back for Dion's body. Having achieved two records that day, another record-breaking opportunity is opening up right before him. The world's deepest body recovery ever. And indeed, Don made no mistake. As soon as Dave resurfaced, diving back to Dion and attempting to recover the body was top of mind. Two days later, on October 30, 2004, Dave secured contact with the dryers, who despite having been resolved to the fact that their son would forever be in the depths of the Bushman's Hole, got a change of heart immediately upon hearing the news from Dave. He went back home to Hong Kong and immediately started planning the details with Don Shirley of what they fondly called, the Big Dive. Don and Dave were in constant communication, almost daily, as they only had around two full months worth of planning. They had scheduled the big dive early January of the following year and even consulted forensic experts on the condition of Dion's body. Although not exactly sure, they presumed Dion would already be mostly skeletonized considering it has been a decade since his tragic death. Not wanting to risk having Dion's bones fall apart during their ascent, Dave together with his wife and designed and made a long silk bag with drawstrings. The plan was to start the dive as early as 6 in the morning and was estimated to be completed in 12 hours. Dave was to go straight down to Dion at 886 feet, free his body from the mud, place it carefully inside the body bag and start ascending after the 20-minute mark. Don would follow 13 minutes after him to meet him at 725 feet, check on Dave's condition, and the body bag containing Dion's body was to be passed on to him as well. Seven other rebreather divers were scheduled to dive down at assigned depths to check on Don and Dave, as they complete their decompression stops and also to pass the body on, so it could be brought back to the surface as early as 80 minutes after Dave starts the dive. It was an elaborately detailed plan, considering the great risks they were about to plunge into. The big dive was an extremely ambitious feat that only the most daring could take on, and Dave Shaw and Don Shirley were the perfect pair to literally dive into the challenge. An airline pilot by profession, Dave has conquered many feats in diving, with his rare MK-15.5 rebreather specifically developed by the US Navy for deep submarine evacuation. British national Don Shirley on the other hand, 
was a retired electronic specialist of the British Army who had moved to South Africa in 1997 and has since been a technical diving trainer. He developed an old asbestos mine that has been deeply flooded into a premier dive spot called Komati Springs. There, he taught both technical and cave diving to divers who sought to take the thrill to a whole new level. In late 2002, Dave first met Don when he went to Komati Springs for a dive, the first of many as Dave found himself going back often to this premier dive site. Dave broke a record in October of 2003 by cave diving to a depth of 597 feet with his rebreather at Komati Springs, with Don as his buddy. Two days after, Don also did a record-breaking dive of being the first diver to reach the very end of the mine's deepest shaft at 610 feet with Dave as his buddy as well. The two elite divers broke records alongside each other, and in just two and a half years of knowing each other, they already had more than a hundred diving hours together. It was Don who first introduced the Bushman's Hole to Dave in June 2004, and since then, Dave got hooked. Needless to say, Don was all in on the big dive just as Dave was. He was determined to minimize all the risks. He prepared 35 backup tanks in the water so Dave and him, along with the rest of the divers would have enough in case they encountered total rebreather failure. He had organized the setup of a rope and sling system that could carry a stretcher up the cliffs of the Bushman's Hole where a recompression chamber was positioned atop the cliff. He got Dr. Jack Mangies on the team, who was a specialist in diving physiology at the University of Stellenbosch, to be on site during the dive in case any medical emergencies arise. Upon knowing that a total of nine divers were involved, Dr. Jack almost backed out as there were too many possible casualties. All seven South African rebreather divers were specially handpicked by Don and it was also Don who asked 35-year-old South African Verna Van Schaik to be the surface marshal. If the whole team were an orchestra, Verna was to be the orchestra's conductor. Verna herself was an elite cave diver, having set the record of being the first woman to reach a depth of 725 feet at the Bushman's Hole in October. The big dive was scheduled on January 8, 2005 but as early as the first day of the year, Dave Shaw already left Hong Kong for Johannesburg. He arrived at Komati Springs on January 2, 2005 to practice getting a body into the bag underwater at a depth of 66 feet. Don took the role of being the body that was to be placed inside the large drawstring bag. It went well and only took around two minutes for Dave to successfully secure Don inside the bag. The following day they went to Mount Carmel, where the Bushman's Hole was located, to meet up with the rest of the diving team as well as a group of police that were supposed to oversee the whole activity since it involved a dead body. Three days before the big dive, Dave went on another practice dive to a depth of 500 feet to get himself accustomed with the underwater camera that he was about to use during the actual dive. He had partnered with South African documentary filmmaker Gordon Hiles to document the whole dive. The camera was a lightweight and low-light Sony HC20 Handycam that had an underwater camera housing specially designed by Gordon and attached to a climbing helmet. Wearing a helmet underwater was something new to Dave. He always carried a high-intensity light with him on his dives and whenever he needed both hands underwater, he would just wear its sling on his neck to secure it so it wouldn't get caught up into something along the way. With the helmet on, he would no longer be able to do that so he practiced and decided that he was just going to sling it on his arm as the need arises. Overall, Dave was comfortable with the weight and design of the helmet camera. On Friday, a day before the dive, they gathered the whole team once more for a final briefing and Dave gave out his final reminders to the divers. The main point he wanted to get across to the diving team was to keep in mind that the most important person in the dive was themselves. If a problem was to arise in the middle of the dive, he reminded them to deal with their problem and forget about him as the last thing that Dave had wanted was to have more than one person dead. He even had this agreement with Don that the only time that Don should come down and help him was if he sent him a signal. Both Don and Dave had this final reminder to the whole team, if Dave didn't make it and Don didn't as well, both their bodies will stay there and no recovery should ever be made of their bodies. They were both clear about it. That same day, in the presence of a group of reporters who had also come to the site to cover the story, Dave made it clear that what they were about to do was an attempted recovery. 
There were no certainties of being able to recover the body and that more than bringing Dion's body back to the dryers, he along with the rest of the team was in this for the adventure first and foremost. The night before the dive, Don was close to not making it to the diving team when a wire snapped in his equipment. After contacting the manufacturer of the damaged component, Don's friend Peter Herbst, who was also a diving instructor and a dive shop owner, was able to troubleshoot the problem so at the last minute, Don was cleared for the dive. Then on January 8th, it was D-Day for Don and Dave. They woke up at 4 a.m. and proceeded on a 10-minute drive to Mount Carmel. They headed down to Bushman's Hole and started gearing up for the dive along with the rest of the diving team, the support divers and the police divers. The paramedics and Verna, the surface marshal, had also already set up the necessary equipment on ground as well. By 6.13 a.m., Dave dived into the deep waters of Bushman's Hole. Theo and Marie Dreyer appeared on scene only minutes after Dave started the dive so as not to add pressure on Dave. Dave eventually reached the bottom of the shot line a minute and a half early, just 11 minutes since he had started. Then, he started to dive along the cave line that he had previously attached to Dion's tank. Upon reaching Dion, he took out the body bag and kneeled beside Dion's body as he tried to get the body out from being stuck in the mud. Although the helium and reduced nitrogen in his trimix were supposed to limit the effects of narcosis, he could still feel it starting. After 13 minutes, Verna gave the go signal to Don to dive next where he was supposed to meet up with Dave at 725 feet. However, at 500 feet, the clear waters made it possible for Don to see Dave's light that was almost 400 feet below him right where he expected Dave to be at that point. Then, he noticed something. The light was not moving. Immediately, Don knew something was wrong. At that time, Dave was already 20 minutes into the dive and according to their plan, he was already supposed to start his ascent by then. There was no movement from beneath him, all that Don could see was the still light. Without a single thought, Don went farther than 725 feet and started diving towards Dave despite the absence of a signal from Dave, as they had initially agreed. When Don reached 800 feet, suddenly, he heard a sharp crack and thud. He looked at his controller, which they had fixed the prior night, and saw that it was completely damaged. Without that controller, Don would be forced to monitor the oxygen levels in his rebreather as frequently as possible so he can manually inject oxygen into his breathing loop. Diving at such a depth with his own emergency situation, he knew his rescue attempt would end up with nothing but three dead bodies at the bottom of the hole. So Don decided to ascend instead as soon as he got his rebreather back under control. Now with the depth that he dived into, his decompression stops required him to stay underwater for the next 10 hours. Then on the 29-minute mark, Verna signaled support divers Dusan Stojakovic and Mark Andrews to meet up with Dave at 492 feet. As they approached their target depth, there were no signs of Dave nor Don. They were supposed to wait for a maximum of 4 minutes but they decided to extend for another 2 minutes before heading back up. When they looked down one last time, they saw one light but were not sure who it was. They wrote on their underwater slate that they did not meet either of the two despite waiting for six minutes and reported the light they saw as they ascended. The next two support divers were Peter Herbst and Loving Erling. The four divers crossed paths and the previous pair showed Peter and Lo the slate before continuing on with their ascent so they could get the word back to the surface marshal. Upon knowing of the single light, Peter decided to dive farther than his intended depth of 275 feet. Don was one of his best friends so he pushed a little further, until he reached a little beyond 400 feet. He stopped as he saw Don and checked if he was okay. Don signaled the okay sign then asked Peter for a slate. Don wrote on it four chilling words. Dave not coming back. Immediately, Peter turned his face downwards to counter-check if there really were no signs of Dave. But the vast underwater cave was just pitch black from the depth they were at. He checked on Don again before starting his ascent. Don met up with Low Vingerling next. When he knew about it, he attempted to dive deeper to do a final check on Dave but Don stopped him. Meanwhile, on the ground, the dryers and the rest of the team waited. Their weight and all the uncertainty was nerve-wracking. 
Not a single person on the ground had the slightest clue of what was happening underwater. More than an hour after the big dive started, the police divers were supposed to resurface with Dion's body in a few minutes. Then they heard the clanging sound of the stones inside one of the plastic bottles which they left floating on the water. The bottles each had lines that dropped to 20 feet deep, at the end of the line was a clip which the divers could use to attach the slate so they could send a message to the ground even while waiting to complete their decompression stop. They pulled the line and got the first slate from Dusan and Mark about not having met up with either Don and Dave but seeing one light below. However, Verna had misunderstood the words and thought the pair reported that there were no lights below. She thought both Don and Dave were missing. Minutes later, the police divers resurfaced with nothing but themselves. Everyone on the ground that waited intently had all but high hopes for this recovery mission and in just an instant, their hopes were shattered. Crushed, Verna proceeded on with the emergency plan. The second slate reached the surface 20 minutes later. It contained the words Don wrote, Dave not coming back, at the same time, contained Don's decompression status. Verna was half relieved to know Don was safe, but she got concerned with the decompression state Don was in having gone deeper than originally planned. With Dave's demise confirmed, the dryer's devastation was the worst. It was a whirlwind of emotions, earlier that day there was eager excitement only to end up twice as tragic as when they first lost Dion. Now, their hearts broke more for the family of Dave and so they retreated to the farmhouse where Don and Dave stayed the night prior with much grief and sorrow. Following the instructions left by Dave prior to the dive, Derek Hughes the underwater cameraman who worked with Gordon Hiles left the scene and climbed up Mount Carmel so he could contact Dave's minister, Michael Vickers. Michael didn't want to presume so he asked Derek to make sure first before anything else, and it was not until two hours later that Derek finally confirmed the news. For Verna however, she didn't have the luxury of time to dwell on Dave's tragic passing. She still had Don and the rest of the diving team to attend to. She deployed Gerhard Dupree's next and specifically instructed him to look for Don and at the same time check on the other divers in their respective decompression stops along the way. It was a little further down below the vast chamber ceiling that Gerhard saw Don. He checked on him and after making sure he was okay, headed back up so he could quickly relay Don's current state. Don continued on with his ascent. However, upon reaching 164 feet, Don started to feel faint. He felt he needed to change from his rebreather to his backup open circuit regulator and he did at an impulse. As soon as he breathed through the regulators, he felt the cave spinning around him. Apparently, a small bubble of helium had formed in his left inner ear. This brought about an awful vertigo. He felt so dizzy that accidentally he had lost the shot line. He struggled as he was spinning around trying to get back to his senses then all of a sudden he saw a flash of white, he grabbed it and indeed, it was what he had been looking for. It was the shot line. When the dizziness had relaxed for a bit, Don checked on his dive computer and it displayed his depth at 114 feet but was warning him that his correct depth at that moment should have been 151 feet. Thus, Don slowly descended down to the correct depth. However, just as he secured the correct depth, he felt nauseous and started vomiting, alternating between taking out his regulator and vomiting then biting on the regulator again. The gas tanks that he had previously set up, attached to the shot line to serve as backup, proved to be vital to Don. He was able to use some of the spare tanks from there. Around 20 minutes after his struggle, Truen Loss appeared before Don to check on him. Don told him through the slate that he was experiencing vertigo and has been vomiting for some time now. Truen first checked Don's trimix if it maintained the correct mix and as soon as he saw Don was already stable, he started with his ascent so he could also get the word to Verna. The next few minutes again alone underwater have become a grueling mental struggle for Don. He fought hard to stay conscious and constantly conditioned his mind to keep breathing. Don was getting exhausted at this point. When Don's state had reached Verna, what was once a relaxed and skillfully orchestrated dive has now quickly shifted into a race against time and circumstance. Verna started sending support divers in overlapping intervals, making sure that Don wouldn't be left all alone. 
The divers took turns, diving up to three or four times to accompany Don in spite of the risk that they themselves were getting into. They clipped Don to the shot line to keep him from drifting away in case he fainted and they would only unclip him when it was time to ascend to another decompression stop. At each stop, Don would vomit. In case of any problems, Don's instructions have also been made clear early on to the team and it was to update his wife, Andre, of any bad news directly and without delay. Andre was left in Komati Springs but with the constant updates, it was almost as if she was on site. Finally 10 hours since he first dived into the water, Don was now at 20 feet deep, freezing and extremely exhausted. He still had 2 hours at that depth and another 2 hours and 20 minutes on his last decompression stop at 10 feet. After complaining of a sharp pain in his lower left leg, they had to risk it and cut short his decompression. Stephen dived back down to bring Don back to the surface. Don spent a total of 12 and a half hours underwater that day and when he was finally out of the waters, on the ground laid down, he still managed to instruct the team not to cut his dry suit. He was immediately placed on a stretcher and was pulled out onto the cliff through the rope and sling system which he had prepared beforehand. 22 minutes later, Don was now in the recompression chamber. Andre surely arrived the following day and took Don for additional recompression treatments in Pretoria. On the flip side, miles away from Bushman's Hole, Michael Vickers brought the heartbreaking news to Anne Shaw in Hong Kong on the evening of the day of the dive. All along, Anne, Dave's wife, thought the dive was still scheduled for Sunday but it turned out Dave intentionally told and a date one day later than the actual dive. When she learned that Dave had already been five hours past the schedule, and knew that was the end of it. Now, the work at the dive site isn't done yet. Peter Herbst was tasked to pull all the lines back to the surface and retrieve all the spare tanks they had positioned at certain depths. Two days after the horrifying incident, on Monday, Peter went back to start with the clearing operations. Come Wednesday, all that was left was to go for the deepest gas tanks. He was joined by his diving buddy, Petrus Roo as well as some police divers that assisted. That day, they also held a quick last-minute memorial service for Dave. Peter couldn't help but give his last message to Dave as he was overwhelmed by emotions. Then the team all sang, Amazing Grace, before the two divers took one last plunge to retrieve the remaining tanks. When they reached 300 feet deep, they clipped lifting buoys to the shot line so they could retrieve the tanks positioned at 500 feet without going that far. As soon as they resurfaced, the police divers met them with the most shocking news. To everyone's disbelief, they had actually found Dion and Dave's body stuck at around 65 feet. When he heard this, Peter returned to the water after resting up for a bit. Then indeed, along the narrow pathways of the hole, he saw Dave floating in an upright position with his arms stretched out. His light was hanging on his arm, pointing downwards, with the cave line tangled up around it. Much to their surprise, Dion's headless body was also there floating, his legs got caught up in the cave line as well. At that instant, Peter already knew what caused Dave's demise. They pulled the lifting buoys to the surface together with the two bodies. Dion's body was taken out of the water first, with the police immediately securing the dead body into a white body bag. To their surprise, the majority of Dion's body was still firm. Dave was pulled out of the water after Dion, his body had been swollen from the sudden change of depth and pressure. Peter then cut off all equipment attached to Dave including the helmet camera. Gordon Hiles was on site the day as well so he was able to immediately check the camera. The camera was still intact, and in it, the answers to all their questions. Though not always clearly visible, the camera was still able to capture all that had transpired during the big dive including the sound of Dave's every breath. In the video, Dave reached Dion at the 12 minute and 22 second mark, a minute since he first touched down the hole's bottom. As planned and practiced, Dave got his body bag and worked on clearing Dion's legs from being stuck. However, just as he did that, a cloud of silt went all over the place and by the time that it cleared up, the camera captured Dion's headless body floating in front of Dave. Right then and there, it was clear to them how things started going downhill. Everything went according to plan, everything was well prepared for, except for this one thing. 
they didn't expect Dion's body to float at all. Apparently, his body was not yet completely skeletonized and instead of decomposing, the body turned into a soap-like substance that had neutral buoyancy. A lot of scenarios have been considered, but not this one. It could have been a lot easier to slip a non-moving body into a bag than have a body freely floating at a depth of 886 feet as you try to secure it inside a body bag. They could clearly hear Dave starting to struggle, he grunted, and his breathing started becoming faster. As he was watching the video, Peter couldn't help it, saying out loud as if telling Dave to breathe slower. They wondered why it didn't come across David's mind to quit the dive and head back up, in the same way that he did back in October of 2004 when he realized his breathing had already increased. Dave kept panting, as Dion's body freely floated and he continued to try making it work. But with Dion's body already floating freely and the cave line attached to him, pulling his body to the surface could have been easily done. Tragically, at this point, Dave couldn't think clearly with the narcosis kicking in. Dion's body was starting to roll and float in different directions, making it all the more difficult for Dave to put the body into the bag. He even let go of his cave light just so he could work with both hands. Now this is one of the most important rules in diving, a diver should not allow any gear or equipment to hang loose. Then, the inevitable happened, Dave's cave light got caught up in the cave line prompting him to untangle it first. It had been more than two and a half minutes since he started working on Dion's body and already three minutes and 49 minutes since he first touched down on the hole's bottom. He began to take out his scissors so he could cut Dion's tanks loose after having been able to successfully wrap the bag around Dion's body. Then, all of a sudden, Dave slipped and lost his balance at the bottom of the bushman's hole. He panted as he struggled to grab the body back as the silt was again all over the place. Despite not being able to think clearly at his depth, Dave constantly checked the time on his dive computer. By the time he was already five and a half minutes at the bottom, he knew he badly needed to start ascending. And so, he started making his way up but his cave light got caught up in the line the second time. At this point, Dave breathed desperately as he started to panic trying to untangle it. He tried moving forward but Dion's body was dragging him down. He still had the scissors in his hands but he hasn't cut anything at all. At the 21 minute mark since he first dived, they could hear the sounds fading away, then one minute later, the movement stopped. Tragically the end of Dave's life. Meanwhile, Don spent seven hours in the recompression chamber that was on standby at the cliff overlooking the Bushman's hole. The chamber had been pressurized to a depth of 98 feet to shrink the helium bubble in his head that caused him severe vertigo underwater. Don was still very weak when he came out of the chamber, so Peter accompanied him as they stayed the night there. While he was recuperating, receiving additional recompression treatments at Pretoria where Andre had taken him, Don finally got to watch the painfully tragic video of Dave. Wanting to see for himself, he watched the video intently on a large screen at the hospital with Peter Herbst and Dr. Franz Cronier, his attending doctor and also part of the official investigation team. As he watched the video, Don couldn't help but unconsciously follow Dave's breathing. Out of nowhere, an idea came to mind, he wanted to do an experiment to follow exactly how Dave breathed from the start of the dive up to his last breath just so they could come to fully understand what happened to Dave. With a CO2 monitor in his mouth, he wore headphones and played the video one more time, with Dr. Franz closely monitoring. Each time Dave breathed, Don also breathed and it came to a point where Don was doing 36 shallow but exceedingly rapid breaths per minute. Dr. Franz noted that it was hyperventilation to a very great degree, excluding the fact that he was on rebreathers at such great depths. When Dave's breathing slowed down to six breaths per minute prior to losing consciousness at the bottom, Don was almost also on the edge of passing out at his hospital bed. He could barely even move and it took 30 minutes before Don could regain control of his breathing. It was then that Dr. Franz came to a conclusion that Dave had actually passed out due to carbon dioxide buildup before eventually drowning in the deep waters of the Bushman's Hole. In a span of two weeks, Don had to undergo 10 other chamber sessions bringing the recompression treatment to a total of 27 hours. It took more than a month before he could think clearly or walk with stability. 
Don improved over time, but the effects of helium had left a permanent effect on his balance. In May that same year, he went back diving for the first time with Peter on close watch, and was overwhelmed with relief that the big dive didn't steal from him the very thing that he loved doing the most. Cave diving. Don and Peter, as well as Nuno Gomez, who was the first diver to have reached the hole's maximum depth of 927 feet, all had this to say about Dave's tragic dive. All that Dave ever planned for was to put Dion's body inside the bag. He stuck to his plan and lost his focus on the dive itself, his mind was fixed on Dion's body and at the depth that he was in, crafting a new plan was just impossible for his mind to do. In spite of the big dive's tragic ending, the whole team didn't think it was reckless. Everyone in the team confidently believed that it was going to be a successful and worthy dive. It wasn't just all about Dion. Verna herself said that with or without Dion, Dave would still have done it anyway. He was still going to dive back to Bushman's hole. In the end, the attempted body recovery was indeed successful. Dion's headless body had been retrieved. On top of that, rebreather diving was taken to record-breaking levels once more. Only tragically, at the expense of Dave's life. The dryers couldn't believe seeing their son's dead body still in its flesh. For Dave's wife Anne, she grieved deeply at her husband's untimely passing but deemed it would be best to scatter Dave's ashes in South Africa, the very place that he has come to love. So, in May of 2005, Don and Andre Shirley drived up from Komati Springs to a summit nearby and threw David Shaw's ashes into the air as they solemnly basked in the setting of the African sun. Thank you for making it this far. If you liked this video, do hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Let us know what you think about this story. We would love to hear from you. Again, thank you and see you in the next one.